J.J. Watt shocked the sports world when he nonchalantly announced that he was retiring at the end of the 2022 NFL season with this Twitter post. While it would not be entirely surprising to see him make a return to the gridiron at some point in the future, the departure now does make sense considering all that he's accomplished in his career, coupled with his lengthy injury history. He's long said that he wanted to go out on his own terms while he was still a good player. He didn't want to be forced out by the sport. If this is the end, then mission accomplished, as while Watt was obviously nowhere near his peak form back in Houston, he was still a solidly productive player the last couple seasons in the desert. And I mean, that's no insult to say that he wasn't the same player he was in Houston, because the JJ Watt that we had the privilege of watching from 2012 to 2015 was perhaps the greatest player in the history of the sport. Yes, that includes all positions, and no, I did not stutter. J.J. Watt forever changed how his position was played and viewed, showing that a 3-4 defensive lineman can be the most ferocious pass rusher in the league, while also being as equal a force as a run defender. His dominance was so unprecedented that he literally broke analytical grading skills like those at Pro Football Focus. Watt was so great that the Texans even used him on offense to score touchdowns, which he also unsurprisingly excelled at. He deservingly racked up accolade after accolade, in one year, he was even a serious contender for league MVP as a defensive lineman on a non-playoff team. If that doesn't speak to just how next level Watt was, then I don't know what else to tell you. But I've got plenty more in the arsenal anyways, so just sit back and enjoy the tale of the one and only Justin James Watt. Now, when J.J. Watt first entered the NFL in 2011, obviously expectations were high, considering he was drafted 11th overall in one of the most loaded drafts in league history. However, there is no way that anyone could have predicted Watt to turn into anything close to the player that he did. He had just 11.5 sacks across his two seasons as a defensive player at Wisconsin. He outdid that total in five of his eight full seasons in the NFL. Most pre-draft scouting reports compared him to Adam Carriker, who the Rams traded for just a swap of late round picks just two years after selecting him 13th overall. Carriker finished his career with 9 sacks in 65 games. Watt was thought to be your standard 3-4 end who could be elite at stopping the run and could just rush the passer in a pinch. His main job would be as a space eater for the guys behind him. Won't consistently get the edge on tackles with his get off or quickness. Mm. Play, <laughs> Whoops. That's, uh, that means I'm slow. <laughs> Plays high at times, can be blown off the ball by a double team, but does fight hard to hold his ground. I do fight hard to hold my ground. Okay, man. all right. That's, all right. Lacks that's, some that's lateral, a backhanded comment. Yeah, lacks oh. some lateral mobility, both rushing the passer and playing in space. Read the one on the bond. His recognition skills leave something to be desired. <laughs> I think they just called you dumb is what yeah, they did. Yeah, that's, that's mean. That's a, that's a knock on the old <laughs> knock. He flashes good hand usage at times, but needs to get stronger at the point of it. Do I need to get stronger? Oh, my God. Um, he needs to gain some more weight to fill out and to continue to learn how to use his hands effectively. Can you imagine what I could do if I learned how to use my hands effectively? Wow. He won't ever be a stud pass rusher. <laughs> <laughs> that was I wish, real. I only wish I could be one. I only <laughs> wish. But he could still stand to learn some pass rush moves beyond his bull rush and occasional swim to the inside if a tackle opens his. Who wrote this? In fact, a lot of Texans fans even hated the selection when it was announced, as those at the team's draft party booed. And the negative comments on their Facebook posts were even more rampant. All that for a guy who turned out to be far and away the best player in franchise history. Funnily enough, even the Texans weren't sure they wanted to pick him. Wade Phillips, who was the team's defensive coordinator at the time, said the draft room was split down the middle 50-50, but he and his side went hard to bat for Watt in one out. Watt had a solid, if not spectacular, rookie season with 5.5 sacks, 11 TFLs, and 4 batted passes, but he really showed his potential in the postseason. In a tied game versus the Bengals with under a minute to go before the half, the ex tight end introduced himself to the world by watching Andy Dalton's eyes, leaping up into the air to nab the ball, and racing 29 yards to the house for a game-changing score. A week later, the TJ Yates-led Texans could do nothing on offense versus the Baltimore defense, but Watt helped keep the team in it with two and a half sacks, tied with teammate Brooks Reed in the same game for the second most ever by a rookie in a playoff game. After the season, Wade Phillips was once again ahead of everybody, officially going all in by saying Watt was a bust. What? You didn't let me finish. In the 2012 training camp, Phillips said, quote, he's going to be a bust. Not a first round bust, but a bust in the Hall of Fame. 
The only players I've seen that can do what he can do with his intensity can be found in Canton. It would not take long at all for Watt to show everyone what Phillips was talking about. In 2012, Watt had one of the greatest seasons by a defensive player ever. Nah, actually, the word defensive is unnecessary in that sentence. Watt recorded at least half a sack in each of his first six games in 2012 and finished the season doing so in all but four of the Texans' 18 games, including the playoffs. He broke the Texans' single-season franchise record by Thanksgiving, finishing with six and a half more than the previous record holder, Mario Williams. Watt now owns the top four single-season sack marks in Texans history. He racked up a whopping 20 and a half sacks in the regular season, becoming just the ninth player to compile at least 20 since sacks began being officially tracked in 1982. With Pro Football Reference's new data going back to 1960, Watt's season is still tied for the 13th best all-time. Tied with another of his later seasons, of course. But the thing is, the other players who put up 20 plus sacks in a season prior to Watt were all edge defenders, either traditional 4-3 defensive ends or 3-4 outside linebackers. The only other interior D lineman to join the club after Watt did so was, predictably, Aaron Donald. Once again, the two defensive players who changed the game of football more than any other during this century. And when he wasn't getting to the quarterback, he was still making impact plays in the passing game. Watt batted down 15 balls in 2012, which not only led the league that season, but is also the most ever charted in a single season by PFF. And he was just as good in the run game, leading defensive linemen and edge defenders with a whopping 52 stops there, stops being defined by PFF as plays that constitute a failure for the offense. Overall, he had 72 total stops, which was 16 more than the next best player at those positions, and he had a league best 33 tackles for loss or no gain nearly double the next highest mark among defensive linemen and edges. All this while missing just two tackles all season, the lowest among all players with more than 52 attempts. He, Geno Atkins, and Vaughn Miller were the only three defenders to finish with grades of 90 plus in overall PFF grading, pass rush, and run defense. Watt unsurprisingly won his first Defense Player of the Year award in a landslide, taking home 49 of the 50 votes. He also joined league MVP Adrian Peterson as the only unanimous selection to the All-Pro team that season. 2013 was a funny tale for Watt and the Texans. Houston won its first two games in dramatic come-from-behind fashion before losing its final 14 games of the season and finishing with the worst record in football. But J.J. Watt was just as dominant as ever. In fact, if you look at his PFF grades, they would argue it was his finest season ever, as his 93.2 grade was a career high and 2.5 points better than any other defensive lineman that season. This time around, he was the only defender to finish with a grade of 90 plus in both run defense and pass rush. Watt's sacks dropped nearly in half from 20.5 to 10.5, but it should be noted that that's still an extremely impressive number for an interior lineman, as it was just a half sack behind the league leader at the position. But when it comes to pass rushing, there's more to it than just sacks. Pressures tell a much more complete version of the story, and Watt actually increased his pressures from 76 in 2012 to 85 in 2013, which was second best across the entire league. He had 22 more stops than any other defensive lineman in the league, and he led all players in tackles for loss or no gain. He was essentially just as dominant as the year prior, yet instead of receiving 49 DPOY votes like he did in 2012, he got merely two in 2013, finishing sixth in the race. It's obvious why that was the case, but I mean, the late Cortez Kennedy ran away with the 1992 Defensive Player of the Year award while playing for the 2-14 Seahawks, and it wasn't for a lack of competition either, as the record 12 players notched 14 or more sacks that season. But I digress. Now, remember how I said J.J. Watt had one of the greatest seasons in NFL history regardless of position in 2012? Yeah, well, he one-upped it in 2014. This was despite starting pretty slowly in the sack department for his standards. He had just two in the Texans' first five games of the season, but finished with 20 and a half, the second such season of his career. His 18 and a half sacks over the final 11 games of the year is his third greatest total for an 11-game span in a season in NFL history. He became the first player to record 20-plus sacks in a single season multiple times since they became an official statistic in 1982. Even with PFR's unofficial data going back to 1960, only Deacon Jones and Mark Gastineau joined him in that club. Watt's 61 stops once again paced all interior D linemen, as his 61 were 13 more than anyone else. He unsurprisingly led the league in batted balls once more with 10, a mark that sits 5th since PFF started tracking data in 2006. And he was getting to the quarterback at a simply unheard of rate, even if you ignore his sack numbers. 
Watt notched 44 QB hits in 2014, which is more than double the next best player. It's the best mark ever charted by PFF, 8 QB hits more than the player in 2nd place, JJ Watt in 2013, and 10 more than the man in 3rd place, JJ Watt in 2015. And get this, the man compiled a whopping 119 pressures in 2014, 34 more than any other player. That meant there was a bigger gap between Watt and the number 2 player, Justin Houston, than there was between Houston at 2 and Brian Robeson in 28th place. Even with the additional 17th game added recently, only two other players have eclipsed 100 pressures in a season since 2006, and they each still fall well short of Watt's 2014 mark. His 92.7 PFF grade for the season was nearly 2.5 points better than any other front 7 defender and ranked 4th among all NFL players. It was a truly historic season for Watt. Now, on to 2015. Oh, wait, what's that? I forgot to mention something? Oh yeah, as if Watt's 2014 season wasn't dominant enough, he went out and became a touchdown machine, moonlighting as an old school two-way player doing whatever necessary to help the Texans win games. Before the 2014 season, the Texans hired Mike Vrabel as an assistant coach. A quick history lesson for those youngsters who only know Vrabel as the Titans head coach, he was a very good linebacker for the Patriots in the 2000s, but he was most famous for his work as a goal line tight end. He has the NFL record for touchdown receptions by a defensive player with 10, and he even caught one in two different Patriots Super Bowl wins. 12 career receptions, 12 career touchdowns. It doesn't get more efficient than that. All of that is to say, we really shouldn't have been surprised to see Supreme Athlete J.J. Watt used in the same exact way once Vrabel was brought aboard. Future Hall of Fame wide receivers Reggie Wayne and Larry Fitzgerald both started 14 plus games and saw 100 plus targets in 2014 and nabbed two touchdown receptions apiece. Meanwhile, Watt scored three touchdowns on his only three receptions that season, with the one in Cleveland being especially impressive, making him look like a natural receiver on the fade route. But he wasn't done there either. With the Bills already up three in the second half and driving in the red zone, Watt took it upon himself to once again make a game-changing play. He went unblocked at the snap, forcing EJ Manuel to make a hasty decision to dump the ball off to his running back to avoid the sack, but it wound up in the arms of Watt, who then raced 80 yards to the house for the score to give Houston a lead they would not relinquish. He also added a fumble return touchdown to his resume two weeks later, when a botched snap by the Colts led to a 45-yard score for the big man. His five touchdowns that year are tied for the most in a single season by a player who played the defense majority of the time. And this is a classic ESPN type stat, but it's notable nonetheless. Watt became the only player in NFL history to catch three touchdown passes and have both a fumble recovery and interception return for a touchdown in a single season. It is no shock to anyone that Watt was named a unanimous first team all pro once again, joining Rob Gronkowski as the only players to do so that year. After being just one vote shy two years prior, Watt finally did nab unanimous honors for the Defensive Player of the Year award, still the only player to ever do so in NFL history. In fact, Watt was so good in 2014 that he even finished second in the MVP race behind Aaron Rodgers with 13 votes. He was the first defensive player to receive an MVP vote since James Harrison in 2008, and first to receive at least 10 votes since Lawrence Taylor won the award outright in 1986. Only three non-quarterbacks and non-running backs have ever won the MVP award, and only two players have ever won the award for non-playoff teams. But Watt had as good a case as any to join both groups. Had Watt had this season a decade or two prior to the MVP becoming an even more exclusively quarterback award, he almost assuredly have won it. In 2015, Watt helped carry the Texans back to the postseason despite their 25th ranked offense per DVOA. That's because he had yet another all-time season. This was despite battling a groin injury and a fractured left hand, as he still started all 17 games including the postseason. His 92 pressures once again easily led the league, and the mark still sits 9th best in the PFF era, making Watt one of just two players with multiple 90-plus pressure seasons. He also led all defenders with 17.5 sacks, making him one of just 12 players all-time to lead the league in the category multiple times, with Deacon Jones being the only player to do so more times than JJ. And Watt also had six games in 2015 with two or more sacks, giving him a grand total of 20 such games since 2012, seven more than any other player during that stretch. For the third time in four years, Watt was named a unanimous first team All-Pro, joining Adrian Peterson once again as the only players to receive the honor. Put it another way, during this four year stretch, only seven times was a player named first team All-Pro unanimously, and Watt made up three of those.
Fittingly, he also won the Defensive Player of the Year award for a record-tying third time in his career, a feat that only Lawrence Taylor and Aaron Donald have ever matched. From 2012 to 2015, Watt put up a monstrous overall PFF grade of 94.8, which was the best among all defenders in the league during that stretch. He had a 93.6 pass rush grade, which ranked first in the league, and he had a 93.3 run defense grade, which also ranked first in the league. He and Von Miller were the only players in the entire NFL, offense or defense, to record a grade of 90 plus in each of the 2012 to 2015 seasons. Watt had 259 stops across those four years, which was 86 more than any other defensive lineman. And his pass rush dominance is even more through the roof. Watt had 69 sacks in this four year run. The next best player had just 50 and a half. In fact, Watt's 69 sacks were the third most ever in a four year span behind just Deacon Jones and Reggie White's best marks, arguably the two greatest pass rushers ever. Additionally, adding in the five and a half from his rookie season, Watt's 74 and a half sacks in his first five seasons are second to just White among the player's first five years since 1960. Moving on, Watt also had 372 pressures from 2012 to 2015. The second best player during that stretch had just 292. The Texan star also had 139 quarterback hits, whereas nobody else had more than 75. When he couldn't get to the passer, he still outshined everyone else with 39 batted passes, 17 more than second place. PFF also has a stat that tracks when a defender beats a pass protector but is denied a pressure due to an outside factor such as a quick release. Even here, Watt laps the field with 47 such plays. Now, you can't just compare Watt to his peers. I'm sure you're wondering how his peak numbers compare to those of the oft-mentioned Aaron Donald. Disclaimer, Donald will likely go down higher on most all-time lists than Watt because he sustained his dominance for longer, only sustaining his first major injury in his ninth season. So paring down his peak to four years wasn't as straightforward as it was for Watt. Ultimately, his 2017 season beat out his 2021 season by a hair for the final year included here. And you know what? Their numbers may not bear out what you would expect. Donald had three more pressures than Watt, but 375 to 372 is an insignificant difference. But Watt had nearly a dozen more sacks and over twice as many quarterback hits as Donald did. However, there was a decently sized difference in terms of pass rush win rate in favor of Donald, who played about 200 fewer snaps. So when it comes to pass rush, you could make a realistic case for either guy. But that's not really the case for other areas of the game. While Watt had a league-leading 106 tackles for loss or no gain, Donald had just 46, which ranked 11th in the NFL. He also had just 145 stops, which was 17th best, compared to Watt's 259, which was top 3 in the league. Donald also had just 4 batted passes across those 4 years, compared to JJ Swatt's 39. That said, the two had identical run defense grades, and Donald dwarfed Watt in overall grading and pass rush grading. However, we must put in context the impact that Watt had on how we view and analyze defensive players today. You see, back in the day, Pro Football Focus used the old plus-minus system to display grades, rather than the standardized 0-100 to 100 grading system we see today. You see, back then, Justin Smith of the 49ers had put up the best grades PFF had ever charted for a defensive lineman, at plus 39.2 for a season, meaning he was 39 points better than the league average. Then, J.J. Watt came around and put up a mark of plus 94.2 in his breakout 2012 season, followed by improved marks of plus 99.8 and plus 107.5 the next two years, about three times higher than the previous best total. When PFF transitioned to the 0 to 100 scale, most of the work was focused on how to accommodate Watt and regular human players on the same grading scale. As Sam Monson puts it, if Watt was a 99.0, even Pro Bowlers didn't belong above a 60. And if Pro Bowl players should have a 90 plus grade, Watt should be like 117 on a scale that topped out at 100. You hear it all the time about players in an exaggerated manner, but here it is absolutely true. Watt's degree of dominance quite literally broke the grading scale. And PFF had to devise the system to act logarithmically at the extremes to be able to contain Watt and any other future freaks yet to enter the league like Aaron Donald. So Donald's dominance wouldn't have even been able to be expressed as it is today without Watt paving the way for him. Two generational players that just happened to come about three years apart this time. All that said, let's just lob one last grenade into the debate. 
PFF has its own wins above replacement metric that combines how well a player performed in each facet of play using PFF grades and how valuable each facet is to winning football games. In short, war represents the number of wins a player is worth over a replacement level NFL player. You mostly see this number cited in terms of quarterbacks since they impact winning the most, but some defenders are dominant enough to cause a stir here as well. In PFF's history dating back to 2006, there have only been four seasons in which a non-quarterback put up a PFF war mark of 1.0 or better. JJ Watt had three of them in consecutive seasons from 2012 to 2014. Donald had the last such season in 2021. Watt's 2015 season of 0.88 is also higher than all of Donald's other years. Put simply, JJ Watt impacted winning more than any other non-quarterback over the past 17 years. Just bonkers. All I know is, you mess with me, you got problems. Sadly, injuries robbed us of seeing how legendary JJ Watt could have truly been. The constant injuries robbed Watt of a big chunk of his peak, and he is still an almost guaranteed first ballot Hall of Famer, which speaks to how great he was. After that superhuman level four year stretch, Watt was always in and out of the lineup. In July 2016, he had surgery to repair a herniated disc in his back that came with a minimum recovery time of eight weeks. And he still returned in time for week one, but in just the Texans third game, he re-injured his back and had to have season ending surgery on it. He returned to play the season opener the following year, but he only lasted five weeks before going down again, this time suffering a tibial plateau fracture in his left leg. Doctors compared the extent of his injury to those only seen in motorcycle wrecks. As detailed in a Robert Klemko piece for Sports Illustrated, quote, when he'd hit the turf, it set off a sort of explosion below his knee. Faced with the same sort of trauma, the typical professional athlete's anterior cruciate ligament would have simply ruptured under the strain, doctor said. For someone of Watt's fitness, that's a six-month recovery process. But his ACL was too strong, they said, and the ligament refused to buckle, transferring the pressure throughout the knee, shattering the bone and cartilage. The great irony was that Watt's maniacal devotion to strengthening his ACL, the single ligament that most often shortens careers, transformed what would have been a relatively routine injury into a uniquely devastating one, end quote. Now imagine going through all of that and then returning to play one of football's most physical positions for 16 games at an all-pro level once again. After splitting between exterior and interior roles, Watt became more of a full-time edge rusher and excelled. He racked up 74 pressures in 2018, which is the fourth most in the league. His 49 stops ranked fourth among all edge and interior players. He was also a ball magnet once again, but this time of a different variety, as he led the NFL in forced fumbles with seven. Watt had the fifth 90-plus graded season of his career as well, with his 90.5 mark placing him third among edges. Additionally, Watt notched 16 sacks, which was second in the league behind just Aaron Donald. It was the fourth 16-plus sack season of his career, a feat that only Deacon Jones and Reggie White have ever matched. Watt was also named first-team All-Pro for the fifth time in his career, which is tied with Jack Youngblood for the third most by defensive end since the merger, behind just Reggie White and Bruce Smith. Sadly, the injury bug caught up to him once again in 2019. He suffered a torn pectoral in Week 8 against the Raiders and was placed on injured reserve. However, Watt made a quick recovery and with the new IR rules in place, he was designated to return late in December to help the team in their playoff push. Midway through the third quarter of the wildcard game against the Bills, Watt beat Cody Ford off the line of scrimmage to take down Josh Allen for a sack. This forced the Bills, who were up 13-0, to settle for a field goal which allowed the Texans to get back into the game and win it in overtime. Now, the 2020 season was a mess and a half for the entire Houston Texans franchise. Watt's box score numbers suffered despite playing all 16 games, but he was still a top 10 player at his position per PFF grading. Watt also hit the 100 sack milestone in the 2020 season, doing so in his 128th career game, making him the 5th fastest to reach that mark ever. He even scored his first touchdown since 2014 with a pick 6 of Matthew Stafford on Thanksgiving. All that said, the team stunk and had all sorts of internal drama. Watt requested his release after the season, which he was granted. He signed a two-year deal with Arizona and helped the Cardinals to a 7-0 start in 2021. However, in that seventh game against his former team, he separated his shoulder, tore his labrum, tore his biceps, and tore his rotator cuff. He was placed on IR for the fourth time in six seasons, and the Cardinals lost seven of their final 11 games. With the Cardinals continuing to fall apart, it flew under the radar how great of a bounce-back season Watt had in 2022. 
Even after experiencing atrial fibrillation on Wednesday, September 28th, and having his heart shock back into rhythm the next day, Watt still suited up and played 79% of the snaps on Sunday. Overall, Watt had 12.5 sacks, 13 TFLs, 56 pressures, and 7 batted passes in 16 games. It was the 5th season of his career with at least 12.5 sacks, a feat that only 5 players have ever bested. And he played better as the season went along, showing that he still has it if he wants to play. He had a 3 sack game against the Broncos in Week 15, he had 4 TFLs alone versus Tampa on Christmas night, and in his final career game after he'd already announced his retirement, he racked up two more sacks for good measure, receiving a standing ovation by the opposing 49ers fans. And this was all while drawing the highest rate of double teams among edge rushers in the NFL per ESPN. From 2018 to 2022, Watt's double team percentage was 29.8%, the highest of 55 qualified pass rushers with 400 plus rushes. A reminder, this was all after the peak of his career. Imagine what the numbers would look like if they were available earlier. Imagine what J.J. Watt's career would have looked like if not for the constant injuries. The fact that one can make an argument that he is the greatest of all time with no hyperbole as his career stands now says all you need to know. Even while including all of his post-surgery games, Watt's career averages are still insane. He averaged 0.758 sacks per game over the course of his entire career, which ranks 9th since 1960 among players who played at least 100 games. It's the best among all players who are mostly interior defenders, and it's better than that of legendary players like Jack Youngblood, Derek Thomas, Aaron Donald, and Bruce Smith. He also averaged 4.6 pressures per game for his career, which is behind just Donald and Von Miller in the PFF era. Watt also put up a monstrous 93.9 PFF grade for his career, fourth best for any defender since 2006. And just for you PFF skeptics, here you go. Per Football Outsiders, Watt notched 56 defeats in 2012, which is six more than any other player that they have recorded dating back to 1994. They define defeats as any of the following, a tackle that results in a loss of yardage, including sacks, any play that results in a turnover, including tip passes which are then intercepted, or any tackle or tip pass that leads to a stop on third or fourth down. But it doesn't just stop there. Watt's 43 defeats in 2014 also ranked fourth since 1994, and his 42 defeats in 2015 are tied for the fifth best all time. Jumping over to Pro Football References TFL numbers, take a guess at who has the single season record since 1999. Yup, JJ Watt with 39 in that 2012 season, followed by a tie in second place at 29 TFLs apiece by 2014 JJ Watt and 2015 JJ Watt. He's one of just three players to lead the league in TFLs three times. Like I said before, no matter how you spin it, JJ Watt is one of the greatest players in the history of the sport of football, and his peak level of play is truly unmatched. JJ's brother and 2021 Defensive Player of the Year TJ Watt was once asked who the better player between the two was, and he promptly put an end to the discussion. I want people to understand how great my brother truly was in his prime. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that it gets lost in today's, and I know he would be upset if I said this, but I think it, it truly is. It's like, you go back and you look at it, you watch the film, you, like, the guy was freaking unstoppable. Like, absolutely unstoppable. He'll never say it, but it's like, I think people need to go back and look at that and be like, the guy was doing incredible things for four or five years, and I think he can still play at a high level. Um, I think I'm too early in my career to compare myself to him at the moment, honestly. Man, I love that. So I have too much respect for him. This kind of admiration and respect for Watt's game was not limited to just his brothers, however. This was prominent throughout the entire NFL. Eight-time Pro Bowl guard Marshall Yonda said, quote, I never played a game record like him. The thing that I respected most about him is his effort. Not even the very elite players played like him. Every play, run, pass, field goal, his drive was unmatched. He'd look over and he'd have his hands on his hips and he'd be breathing hard in a long series. Then the next play, he comes as hard as he did the first player of the game, end quote. Former Texans tackle Dwayne Brown was likely happy he was Watt's teammate and not opponent, saying, quote, He comes in the 10th pick of the draft, a D-lineman, and you always think on the offensive line, we're going to kick this kid's ass. He was a problem from the first day. His get-off on the snap was incredible, like I hadn't seen before. One play, a trap play, I pulled and blocked him and knocked him down. I celebrated. Big play for us. I looked at him and he smirked. That turned into revenge. The rest of the practice was hell for everyone. I mean hell. Every day was a competition. Who could run the fastest 10-yard shuttle? Who could bench the most? Who could win practice? He made me better every day. He got there in 2011, and I'm convinced my best three years in the NFL were his first three years in Houston. And when even some of the greatest quarterbacks of all time sing your praises, you know you were something special as a defender.
It's easy to sit here and say that we were robbed of JJ Watt's full career because of all the injuries, as evidenced by how many times I've said just that in this here video. But as he heads into retirement, what we should really be doing is celebrating what we did get to see of JJ Watt, because damn man, if that was not one of the most dominant athletes I've ever seen, I don't know what is. The versatility he showed was unmatched, going inside and outside, rushing the passer and stopping the run, batting down passes and scoring touchdowns, all while putting in more effort and hustle than any other player in the league, showing a superhuman kind of resilience and mental strength to keep bouncing back after the many setbacks. Now it would be remiss not to mention that, as cliche as it sounds, he was every bit as good a human being as he was a football player. He helped raise over $37 million to help Houston recover from Hurricane Harvey and even spent time on the ground doing actual work. He founded the Justin J. Watt Foundation, a charity organization that provides after-school opportunities for children in various communities to help them get involved in athletics in a safe environment. He donated $350,000 to the Houston Food Bank to aid in relief efforts during the COVID-19 pandemic, has supported Make-A-Wish kids, and he often offers to pay for funeral expenses after national tragedies. I'm sure Watt's Walter Payton Man of the Year award means more to him than any of his three DPOYs. JJ Watt is a Hall of Famer, as both a player and as a person. Yes, it is a shame that his full career was not realized, but what we got was nothing short of phenomenal. At his peak, JJ Watt was not only the best player in the NFL, he was arguably the most dominant player in the history of the sport.